Are you going to? Okay, that's good. Uh, hi, I'm Milos. I come from Serbia. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, so, what I'm going to do today is like, the workshop is called Moral Philosophy. Uh, but I'm not one of these people who are just going to give you like the lecture that you receive at university, which you can look online if you want. I'm not going to talk in depth about what what is the difference between Kant and Hegel and stuff like that. I think that's boring. I think that's not useful. You're never going to use it in a debate. Who cares? So it's going to be a debate useful exercise. No, not exercise. Debate useful. Uh, how do you say? A lecture in which I'm going to talk about. How do you burst utilitarian bubbles? How do you increase burdens? How do you uh, prove your utilitarian bubble uh, to say so? How do you debate and engage uh, with your principal point and not uh, uh, not let it be discounted by judges or something like that? So this is basically uh, my what my lecture is going to be about. If you don't understand me or if I'm talking too fast, just stop me and I'll repeat. Uh, I like, don't be shy. If you want to ask questions, just ask. Uh, after some certain, uh, like I, if after I do a section, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, and that's pretty much it. <coughs> Are there any questions about this? <laughs> Probably not. Right. Cool. So let's start from the from the from the top from the beginning. So basically, and there, you can divide everything that we're doing today into like two categories. So this is grossly oversimplifying. The, so so. Basically, if, if you want to define debating, debating is basically grossly oversimplifying uh, things that people study for like their PhDs in seven minutes. Like this is basically debating. So this is what we're doing here as well. So basically, like we can divide philosophies into like the ontology and utilitarianism. So. And this is what usually people call, oh, this is my principal point. <laughs> when they say principal point, they usually mean the ontology and stuff like that, even though they might sometimes confuse it a, a, a bit. So let's talk about what is it, why is it, and stuff like that. So you guys know about trolley problem, right? Yeah. Th that's basically how it so so oh fuck me. So for people who are not who are not familiar with it, just just to briefly go over it, uh, there's a thought experiment that is necessarily telling you a lot how judges judge debate as well on their intuition and not necessarily logic and stuff. So this is basically an experiment. If you're a trolley driver, a trolley, you know what trolley is, right? I, I didn't know first time, so, so that's I have to ask. Uh, so uh, you, your car, your, your brakes broke and you're running down the hill and five people are working there. I don't know what the fuck are they doing. They apparently cannot move in this, in this uh, scenario and you're gonna run them over or uh, the only thing that you can do is take a detour and uh, how do you say, take another route which is gonna run over one, per one person. So like literally one versus five. Uh, like, like show of hands, that's always fun. Uh, would you take a detour? Would you save five people or not? Who would? Nice. Everybody's utilitarian. I, I, will, I would also be. I would also, it's, very, it's very difficult to do this. And, and literally, the, the second part that usually people are talking about, and this is pretty much illustrating uh, how to prove to judges, uh, how to prove to judges uh, deontology versus utilitarianism and stuff. So the second, second question that I would ask you is, so you're not driving a trolley anymore. A trolley is driving itself. It's a self-driving trolley or whatever. And it's going to hit these five people anyway. And you're standing above like a bridge, on a bridge, like looking down on the tragedy. And next to you uh, is me, like a fat person uh, who's, who's gonna, uh, if you push me over, if you push that poor fat person over, uh, you're gonna stop the train and you're gonna kill that person, but the five people will be saved. Would you push the, the, the fat guy? How many people will push the fat guy? So, ah, exactly. So this is what this is this is literally what what it what it illustrates how debates are judged. Why? why? Because these two scenarios are pretty much similar, right? They're the same. Uh, if you're consistently being utilitarian, you should vote for the same, you should be say five people, it doesn't matter, right, in this sort of situation. So it tells you that by uh, making something sound as like, uh, making appealing to like disgust or appealing to like common sense in judges and in people is a way to necessarily prove, how do you say, that we're not really that utilitarian, right? We shouldn't push fat people just to save five people in this sort of situation. So I'm gonna talk a bit briefly uh, a bit after that, but that's beautifully illustrating this stuff. So 
deontology, and let's talk about this. So, so deontology would be uh, do not interfere one guy over five guys. It's, it's, it's not your decision to make. Uh, whilst utility would necessarily measure how many, how much happiness are we accumulating and make a decision based on that. So you can say that <coughs> utilitarianism is basing the moral principle on the consequence of the principle. And the ontology is basing it on the act itself. So the ontology is basically saying that some action is moral or immoral, irregardless of if the consequence is good or not. Whilst utilitarianism will basically be the ends justify the means. If the end goal is more utility, then that's good, and that's that's how you decide the moral action. So these two things are necessarily trying to define what is moral and what is immoral. But so the one one thing that I want to dispel before I go delve deeper into this. Something being morally or immoral is sometimes too fetishized by people, especially in debating and research situation. Just because something is immoral doesn't mean that you never do it and there never, nobody ever does it in this situation, right? So a lot of the stuff you can say that they're immoral, but people do it and they're alive and it's fine. It's not that it's not like people are sinful creatures and stuff like that. So it's not that fetishizing, and especially in debating when people are trying to fetishize this and, and, and do that, you, you can dispel some of, these, some of these things. So let's... So the problem usually in debating is that second thing to people sounds way more logical than the first thing. It sounds way more logical. Yeah, we should obviously save five people rather than one in this sort of situation. <coughs> so the point that you have to make and the, the hard job that you have to make is to try to dispel why is it not. And it's usually done by the thing that I told you. This is the analogy point. This is trying to push the burden on the other side into like a higher direction. I'm gonna tell you how. So, but first, let's dispel what, is, what the ontology is uh, in order to get on the same page. Because like usually uh, when I see people claiming that they're having a principal point, but they're really not having it. And they're thinking about <coughs> they're having it. So if you're trying to claim, we have moral responsibility to help these people, right? Uh, this is not a principal point, this is not the ontology, because the, the crucial point of that argument is that this will help people, and then it's in line with utilitarianism. It's basically the same thing. So if you prove that it's help, it's gonna help people, and, or if you prove that it's moral obligation to help people, this is pretty much the same thing. These, you cannot work uh, without the other. If you tell me uh, moral obligation to help the minorities, and I come from the opposition and say, this is not gonna help the minorities, you lost, because that's, this policy is not going to help the minorities. You didn't fulfill your burden in the first place. So, <coughs> what is the ontology necessarily entail? After every sentence that you say that is like a principal point, we shouldn't torture people, or we should do this, we should give more money to minorities, or we should, uh, I don't know, ban something. The end sentence that is going to test whether this is a deontological point or not, irregardless of this, regardless of this night, this having a positive consequence, we shouldn't do this. So even if this leads to a positive outcome, we still shouldn't do this. And this is your burden, right? Because these two things overlap. If both sides pro provide that it's going to have a positive outcome, then these two things agree, and there's not the ontological point. This is utilitarian point as well. It doesn't matter, right? If you prove, but the ontology is specific to say that even if it might help us, even if it might have a good consequence in the end. We still shouldn't or should do this or that or some of these things. So this is, for example, torture, right? You can claim that sometimes in certain circumstances it might have a positive effect. You, you should still rebut that it will have a positive effect. But the end goal of your principle is even if it does have a positive effect, this is why uniquely we shouldn't do this ever, blah, blah. And stuff like that. So this is just the thing to take care of, always, always to have in your mind when you're trying to prove. If you're not proving that, then you, you you literally don't have a principle. You think you have a principle. You think your judge is judge is fucking you over by not taking account your principle, but that's not a principle. This is utility. This is the same because it's based on the consequences and based on how you say the outcome being good. So the ontology is necessarily tied to outcome, even if the outcome is not good. So cool. So the way to compare these, stuff, these two things is usually, <coughs> and this is how these things are engaged, 
to try to make the other side look absurd and to try to make the other side look more unreasonable than you. So as I said, nobody has a PhD in philosophy and even if you do, judge doesn't have a PhD in philosophy and judge cannot insert himself into the debate. It's like, uh, like every regime food says. So basically, this what we're doing in the debating is pop philosophy. It's not like, ooh, what it can't say about my own. No, no, it's literally the gut feeling uh, that you have proven something or not. And it's basically more in, in the psychology than anything else. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving you the real talk. I know this is wrong and it should be different. I'm just giving you how the judges operate. And when I realized this, I started watching more debates in this sort of situation. So how do you do that? So increasing the burden of the other side is one of the more, most important things. <coughs> so if you have a ontological point, it's pretty easy for utilitarians to claim that they have much more benefits and blah, blah, and judge should buy it, right? And if it, if it stays like this, it sounds very sensible to judge to go for the, for the safe side. For example, uh, one of the Euro's motions was uh, this house believes that Western uh, med uh, pharmaceutical companies or medicine companies should not should cut all ties with other uh, pharmaceutical and medical companies who do not adhere to the same ethical standard as they they have. Like not not uh, telling people like uh, not having the ethical studies, like not telling people the side effects, like loads of this stuff. This is obviously bad, right? So obvious case for Gav is, look, this is wrong. Like people are being told that the side effects are wrong, that the side effects are awful, people might get hurt, like they have the right to know. In the obvious case for the other side, this is gonna speed up, this is gonna speed up us uh, getting a new drug on the market, this is gonna speed up people, how do you say, finding a cure, and the cure is gonna solve and, and cure a lot of people, and this is great, right? So it's very difficult. I mean, that sounds very sensible, right? We are trading off something, uh, some of the lives here in order to save much more lives because we will find this, how do you say, find this drug uh, way or later. So the way to combat it, and the way, to, for example, I combat that from, from opening government is basically to try to increase the burden. My question to them, my case was, if your logic follows and if your morality of utilitarianism follows, then presumably you should be for the eliminating the ethical standards overall in the whole world, not just for, by this motion, right? Because if your moral principle is we should save as many lives by finding the drug the fastest, then you're undermining it by not supporting the full thing. Why not? Like, the, what is the difference in this situation? So that's either making them take up a very high burden that we should like lift all the ethical standards and fuck the ethical standards, which is very uns not sensical for judge to buy, or they have to backtrack and say, oh, it's a bit different and something like this, and the way, and, and both sides to win for you. If they accept it, you have a much easier case to be like, oh, this is ridiculous, obviously. But if they don't accept it, they have just shown you that there is a limit to do utilitarianism that we're not crossing. And the only thing that you have to do from your side is to say why this also falls under that category, and then you won, right? So it's already easier because the judge is now believing, and the other side has confirmed that there should be some limits of utilitarianism, and that they're fucked. So on both sides, this is the way to this is the way to do it. So usually, <coughs> couple of so this was the direct example, but usually you can do other examples. For example, uh, if we talk about the criminal justice policy, I don't know, if they are defending, uh, like, I don't know, more policing or something like this, or a preemptive incarceration, you get, like, like, the analogies that you give to them in these sort of situations. If their logic is, we should maximize utility by eliminating crime because the, the victims are the most important stakeholder in this case, right? This is their logic, and you use their logic against them if you say, for example, but look, if you preemptively jail people, uh, and you preemptively, like uh, before they even do something, or people who have a high risk factor, jail them, you might also get a lower amount of crime, but would you be willing to do this? You're also giving them in a very fucked up situation. Because if they say so, again, it's much easier for you to combat and be like, look, this is obviously ridiculous. We don't do that to human beings. But the second point is if they concede, they have conceded a large part, and that is that their principle has a limit, 
and then you have a much easier job to do that. So, the, like I said, prominent examples that you give is literally, uh, would you be willing, like, slavery is sometimes useful, would you be willing to do this? And then they cannot say yes, because they would, like, equity. <laughs> no, but, like, they, they, they wouldn't be able to do it. Like, uh, incarcerating people preemptively might be, might sometimes lead, torturing people might sometimes lead to beneficial outcomes. Just having this visceral analogies, from one side that is gonna make them either concede something to you uh, or, how do you say, backtrack is very useful when the judge is then gonna be deciding this uh, uh, this clash and it's gonna be deciding that they might need to overthink the utilitarianism part, right? Uh, does that sound logical to you? Do you have any questions? Cool, uh, let's move on. So that's the, first, that's the first step and that's the, that's the first step towards, towards how do you say, trying to win uh, on the unlevel playing field. This is obviously true, vice versa, right? So it's much more important to do it to utilitarianism, but you can also do it to deontology and stuff like that. Uh, by creating absurd situations in which it would be unreasonable to not be utilitarian in these sort of situations. So, uh, as I said, uh, would you kill a person, like killing is immoral, or like people, uh, how do you say, um, this, was, this, this was for example a debate, a debate now in the World Championship, it was a debate about uh, eliminating the international rights protections towards terrorist organizations, right? So I was opening government. It was a shitty position because like everybody's gonna bash you. Oh, you wanna torture terrorists? Ah, oh, no. And so like, I envision that that's gonna happen in this your situation. So their logic in, upon their, upon their, how do you say, uh, upon their uh, principle was literally, look, there is something unique about human beings. We, that we don't like how they say to be tortured, uh, we don't like how they, uh, <clears throat> we value our lives, we don't want people to kill us, this is why we live in the society, uh, this is why like torture is very bad, blah, blah, blah. My direct question to them is, look, if there's something unique about like your life and about like not getting tortured and stuff like that, presumably also that would apply to not fighting terrorism at all because like fighting terrorism means killing these people in the first place, right? In this sort of situation. So that also means that they either have to concede that we shouldn't fight terrorism or they have to find some differentiation towards it. They didn't do this, they, they like the guy said, but it's, but yeah, but it's strategically important to fight terrorism. And that's where, where you get them because like, yeah, then the only thing that I need to prove is that this is also strategically beneficial and something that we need to sacrifice, right? So this is this back and forth that is going to happen in the debate in the first place. <coughs> so one of the other, so this is increasing the burden. The other thing is pointing out I mean, I am EFL, also, so this is, this is going to pointing out arbitrariness in their case. So, a baby is drowning, and it's drowning like in, in this, this, this deep water. Uh, do you have a moral obligation to say it? Like you're here. You say yes, right? Okay, cool. Uh, the, babo the baby is like a meter away. Uh, a bit deeper water. Do you still have a moral obligation to save it? Yes. A baby is a kilometer away. Do you still have an obligation to save it? So, the, the, the point of this exercise is to show how arbitrary it is to say that kilometer, you don't have a moral obligation to save it, but 99, 999 meters you have, right? At some point, there will have to be a cut, right? After which, it's not moral or immoral, right? So this is where you want to try and relativize the moral morality principle, and you can relativize, right? So especially utilitarianism. If they're trying to say, like, look, uh, this is going to save a lot of people, right? This, this, uh, this policy, and this is going to this is gonna benefit. The, the, the way to present it, the way to relativize their case is also to point out how, what is, what is the cutoff? Like, is it 100 people? So 99 people say no, but 100 people is fine, right? How do you quantify that? And after which point are you fine with this trade-off? And the answer is usually the utilitarians have to be fine with anything that is increasing the utility. 
So two lives against one. This is also so. So this is why trolley problem is fucked up because like they say five to one, and people are like, yeah, five people. Look how many this is. But utilitarians should also answer that same question, one to two, right? Or half a person, I don't know, two and a half men, or, or something like this. They should, so, so if the principle is maximizing utility, maximizing happiness, it's not about the numbers, it's just that the one, the number is 1% or something higher than the, my number, and then what, what, I'm, what I'm doing. And this is very crucial for, how do you say, relativizing their burden because they utilitarians and people who run these cases are usually going to portray it oh look but what is one life in comparison to thousands that we're willing to save in this sort of situation but their logic and their burden is not like that because it's very it's very relative right so this is what you point out like the arbitrariness of distance of the numbers and of stuff and how do you determine fucking it, this is not how we determine morality by the fact that <coughs> there is a some number of number of how do you say people that are worth be saved, worth being saved, and some some people aren't worth getting saved. It gets ugly if we try to measure these things. So so this is basically where it starts starts to be even more sensible to your judge that utilitarianism is not necessarily the answer. It's not a perfect case. It's not like if you say this, you won, and that's fine. And it's, there there is no such case because that then uh, like that would be a shitty thing. Uh, but like like this is already starting to relativize and like burst the utility inside the, uh, like inside of the judge's mind and how they should view the thing. So then the last thing that you must do is provide, so if you say that something is arbitrary, is a number, shouldn't determine morality of a certain situation, then you, or contrary, at least have to provide what should define morality in the first place. So this is also what people are usually missing. That, that's their circular logic when people are saying something is wrong because it's wrong because it's wrong because it hurts and it's wrong and something like that. so that that's that's usually how I, how I hear principles and that that's very bad so you have to pick one thing so you have to pick something that is very how do you say you cannot you cannot prove it by 100% but you have to pick a fighter which people are going to accept is important for example that can be consent right so that can be how do you say fairness and justice there is a, a couple of things that you can pick and it is going to be your fighter as a way of determining the morality of the action in these sort of situations. So Kant used to say that it's like uh, morality should be judged by if you imagine everybody doing the same thing, would the world look good or not? So we determined that stealing is bad and stealing is immoral because if everybody stole, if everybody behaved like that, it would be a shitty place to live, right? It's not about one situation, it's not about like somebody stealing bread, but imagine everybody doing this, and this is like, if something is moral, then presumably everybody are fine with doing this. This is how you should judge it. Like if everybody killed each other, then it would be a shitty place, and stuff like that. You don't have to do this, you don't have to go that route, you can do, do it much easier. Uh, because like people are usually not gonna fight that consent is something that matters, or that lottery of birth is something that matters, but you have to tie it with something like this. So, for example, uh, usual construction. I'm sorry, I have to take the, the throat there because it's starting to, to hurt like a motherfucker. Usually, a very cool and important mechanism is the lottery of birth mechanism. So this is where you're trying to say that, look, you haven't chosen to be born. So the fundamental beginning of your life is starting with a fundamental like taking the choice away from you. So the obligation of society is to try to maximize your choice and to try to let you live as like maximum as you can in this sort of situation. This is something that obviously can be disputed and something that, that, that is fine to be disputed. And this is why debates exist. But this is something that is cool and it's already starting to look like some sort of argument, right? So we shouldn't limit people's choices if at the beginning they couldn't choose to opt into this life in the first place. So this began as a fundamental act of, of non-choice, but also we're plagued with stuff like, how do you say, our choice is limited by stuff like self-preservation instinct. So everybody has an instinct that they want to survive, even if they might not be good for them or something like this. So this is also limiting your choice. Also like the way that you have been brought up, like 
the society that you grew up with, the genes that you have, not, not genes, but like <laughs> genes, uh, genes that you have is all limiting your choices and the abilities to make stuff, right? So in this regard, your life is like is full of these shackles and full of these like awful stuff. So as a society, we should maximize your ability to choose in it. And that can prove a lot of stuff in this sort of situation. And like, that can prove that you shouldn't coerce, coerce people uh, by not telling them what are the side effects of the drugs that they're taking, specifically because then they cannot make an informed choice because like, they don't know in this sort of situation. So, so <coughs> this is one of the ways to do it. And this is like, this is how you can construct something that is much harder to take down. It's obviously gonna be tried, like people are gonna try to take it down, but it's gonna be harder for them. So let's look at it. If you look, for example, at direct morality motion, which, for example, was at Euro's ESL quarterfinals, which is, this house believes that it's immoral to have children, right? And this is an obvious case for government, right? So it's immoral because like, kids cannot opt out, not opt, they didn't choose to be born. So in this sort of situation, you're forcing somebody to live through something that they didn't do it. It's akin to slavery. It's akin to like akin. Uh, it's it's similar to like, like forcing people to to do something they don't want. And we believe that's immoral because there is no justifiable reason to do it. So let's do a flip thing because I'm, like right now, what we did is like pretty obvious. You shouldn't have children, right? But let's do a flip thing. And it's usually, I'm, what I want to illustrate with this point, it's usually very cool if you have these types of motion to try and agree on the metric and then inside of that metric try to win on different things. So people wanted to try to bring up, uh, for example, opening up and that debate, try to bring up, oh, but you're gonna be happy as a parent, unrelevant because like these people are saying it's immoral to do something about it oh you might be happy as a child again irrelevant because the the thing is not happiness the, the their point is choice their point is you cannot choose this so we shouldn't force it on you you might be happy but we shouldn't force it on you cool for example the clash that you can't do and there are two two things is if you take consent in the first place uh the thing that we did is so if we imagine somebody like in non-existence, like Schrodinger's cat is existing and non-existing at the same time, and if we can ask them, if we could like be like interview, like, would you want to be born? Sure. Would you not? Sure. Some people will bu are bound to say yes, some people are bound to say no, right? So it's 50-50 in this sort of situation. So the thing that, I, that you want to possibly frame it is to say, well, look, it's not a harmless thing that you're doing from Goff's side. You are denying some people who would want to be born a chance to be born and a chance to live, right? So this is the thing. So you're trying to flip, you're trying to flip the thing that you're saying. You obviously didn't win immediately by saying ha ah, and they said down no. But like that's where you where the work begins. And this is where you can try to mitigate their point while bringing up your point. It is crucial for people that would want to live to live because like life can be amazing, right? But if you don't want to live, uh, you can never, if you want to live, you can never opt into life. You can never make yourself be born, right? You can never be like, I want to be a baby here or something like this. But sad as it is, you can opt out of life in comparison, right? You can commit suicide, you can not like live, you can choose to, to opt out of society or to choose to live in a monastery or to do something like this. So you have, in comparison, even though both situations are shitty in terms of choice, this brings us a little bit more choice, and that's why, Mr. Chair, you should judge for us, right? So this is this is this is basically how how you can try to do it. Obviously, this is not perfect, but it's trying to illustrate that it's very cool to try to think about this flipping of how they say their metric rather than reframing their metric. Obviously, you can try to reframe their metric and say, like, oh, consent is not important. Who cares? So let's do that as well. Um, one of the cool things <clears throat> when you try to talk about consent, when you talk about like people, uh, people how is it choosing and not choosing and stuff like that, is to try and relativize what, the ability to choose in the first place, right? Because if the choice is almost impossible, or virtually impossible, then it doesn't matter and something else should matter, right? So this is possibly the, the thing how to defend utilitarianism, right? If you provide to me that the choice is so limited by, like I said, the genes, 
uh, your societal pressures, uh, your self, how do you say, uh, self reservation instinct, and stuff like that. This means that you're not really choosing all of stuff that you're doing. You think you're choosing, but you're not choosing in this certain way. So, given that the choice is pretty much out of your hand and it's pretty much influenced by a lot of stuff around you, you can then frame that it's less important than other stuff. So, you can frame that if we don't have as much choice, we should care about something else. We should care about minimizing the harms to these individuals or minimizing the awful situations where they're in, where they, where they have like shitty, shittiest options that they're forced into, right? <coughs> so, this is one of the ways to. This is one of the ways to, to, to do it, and this is one of the ways to, to, to provide it. Provide that analysis. Uh, cool. Do you have any questions about so far? Yeah. Uh, so, in one of the situations for trolley problems, there have been various uh, philosophers who have changed, like you added a fat person, they've, they've changed instances. So, one of the instances that one of the, uh, one of the lecturers added is, what if you know that the one person, the, the, the five people are, let's say, uh, criminals, repeated offenders, when the other one person is, is never been accused of something like that, and you're aware of these situations. Uh, how, would, how good is it to use an argument like that in terms of like utilitarianism, wherein you know the kind of choice you're making may not be the best to <coughs> save it? It's very difficult to prove, especially if you do a proper enough job as a deontologist and as a person that's going to say, like, look, we do not do this kind of stuff even if they bring us uh, benefit. So usually this, this manifests, what you say, usually manifests in debates about criminal justice. When we talk about, oh, should we care about, like, should we lock people up for a longer period of time because who cares about them? We care about future victims and stuff like that. It's still not as easy, right? If you provide to me the analysis that is gonna say, like, look, these people didn't choose to commit this crime in the first place. They have been thrown into, like, awful situation from the get-go, they had like like uh, societal, how do you say, poverty and stuff in the first place. You can relativize their ability to choose and then relativize their guilt in the first place, right? This is a very powerful way to do it. When you, when you start a debate like, for example, retribution is great, uh, retribution shouldn't be used in sentencing or something like this. One of the better ways to, 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 to dispute this is to dispute the actual agency of these people to, to choose some of, the, some of these things and actually then try to provide, because it's very easy for them to shit on you and say like, oh yeah, uh, these people are rapists, criminals, awful people, who cares about them and stuff like that. But if you relativize and blame it on a society and say that, look, we have created the conditions upon which some of the people in society are not receiving a proper, how do you say, uh, proper uh, alleviation of poverty, proper education, proper mental health, how do you say, uh, proper mental health care in this situation where they can go out of these situations, we still, and this is where, where it's crucial, we still do not let them go. We should still not like be like, fuck, fuck, yeah, who cares, let, let's do whatever. But we should still like care about them and not like have unnecessary and cruel punishment towards them. And we should do the bare minimum in order to make them reintegrate into society. This is a way to, to like frame and to, 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 to prop up. Some of these things. Usually, it's not not that easy. Like the other side, and the, the better stuff for the other side is like, and what you said. <coughs> who do we care more about? Like people, like both sides didn't choose. Like people who are victims still also didn't choose to be victims and didn't choose to have this awful situation. So why should we like care about how they say? Why should we not care about them and like their closure from uh, or not receiving closure from them receiving lower punishment or something like this? So this is a valid clash. This is why this debate works in the first place. But there is a back and forth. And this is this is the way to do it. So for example, one of the one of the things that how to defend it and how to like backtrack off of it is to claim that. Victims are never going to be fully satisfied. However much you increase the sentence, one year is not gonna. It does not equal uh, how do you say uh, one year of closure like faster, like uh, closing the, the, the issue faster. In this sort of situation, they're always gonna re-emphasize however much we we put a price on it because like you always re-emphasize the thing that happened to you. This doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't do it, and this you still have to do a lot of proper job and do. Telling to me why this is a problem and why, why, how do you say, why should we value uh, <coughs> a criminal uh, rather than rather than uh, rather than this person? But like, it's still 
a battle is in like trying to relativize the other side. And this is what I'm trying to to prove with with the whole workshop in this whole situation. And trying like you know that you're starting from a fucked up position in the debate. And I love this debate personally because like especially people get too cocky from the other side and be like, ha ha, I'm winning. And this especially if they're American, they they're like so cocky, like it's this obviously true. He says this is obvious. There is no government here. There is no op or something like this. And then they lose. And then they're sad. And then I'm happy, uh, <laughs> especially happy uh, in, in this sort of situation. So that's I think that's that's more fun part of the debate. If you get to debate something, the judges on the first glance are going to be like, yeah, uh, no, not nope, not really. This is not something that my moral intuition is telling me that should be done. Right? You're in a tougher position. So as I said, like. Obviously, in a perfect world, you would have a perfect computer-like judge who would be like assessing every subclash with, like, we, we might come to that AI, uh, AI thing. But like, the reality is, judges are human. Judges are people who have their own biases, who have their own intuition, and usually, the way they buy or not buy your argument is basically on their moral intuition. Does this sound fine, or does this not sound fine? Cool. So let's talk about one more way to 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 defend stuff. And this is this. So, I already talked about consent and law during birth. So let's talk about justice a bit. <coughs> and I've already talked about like if you didn't commit something, you shouldn't answer for it. So if you didn't have, uh, how do you say, if you uh, didn't have a choice in a matter, you you're not punished. And this is where you you throw in a lot of analogies. If somebody threatens your life and says to do something, we do not punish you or something like this. And you can say that poverty or how do you say, not having a mental health care or something like this are pretty similar. And this is where you draw the analogy, and this analogy starts to become much more sensitive to a judge. Well, one more thing that you can do is literally appealing to, to, to people. <laughs> and this is through Rawls' theory of justice. Like the most simplified version. If we were to divide a cake, uh, and if you didn't know you were to divide a cake, and if you didn't know, uh, which portion are you gonna get? You are much more, most likely to divide it equally. And fuck that, that, that that's proving communism, which that we don't care that much about. But like, on the contrary, if we were to live in a world, if we were to create a world upon where, for example, everybody would be better off, but one person in this room, we don't know who, we're gonna get tortured every day with awful stuff. He's gonna listen to this workshop for eternity, it's gonna be awful. No, uh, but uh, uh, you wouldn't choose that that world. Why? Because there is a possibility that you are gonna be that person, and the possibility and risk is too high for you. And this is the problem where people are trying to put and push their moral, how do you say, uh, their morality, if they're not the ones who are gonna suffer the consequences in this sort of situation. So this is very cool. For example, sometimes to, to talk about, when you talk about immigration debates, and this is also where, where Americans look at it, and where they, where they say, ha, oh, obviously we should take more migrants. And this is where you get a lot of these Hollywood people, uh, calling like, oh, get more migrants, fuck you Donald Trump, uh, fuck you Donald Trump anyway, but like, uh, but like, oh, uh, immigration is like, done deal, we should obviously take more migrants and stuff like that. So, one of the ways, one of the ways to, how do you say, conduct this argument is literally to talk about it's not affecting everybody in society, but the people who it is, for example, affecting are the people who are the lowest paid jobs, who now have much more competition for their jobs, which means that they have much lower pay, which means that they have much lower, how do you say, working conditions, and how do you say, they're, they're competing against somebody and like losing their jobs in an awful situation, and we as a government owe these people who are already there much more than we owe potential people who are not here in this situation. Especially if you frame it in a way that the most poor people in society are usually the minorities and are usually people who are they claiming, oh, we should help in this sort of situation, right? So, like, usually, like, black communities are the most impoverished in America, and by getting more immigration, they're the ones who are losing most of these jobs. It's not Meryl Streep who's going to lose their job, who's lose her job, or something like this. So, this is bringing me to the next most important point. When you're defending something that sounds like not really illogical, but sounds very, like very, uh, how do you say, the other side sounds more and more, how do you say, reasonable and stuff like that. 
uh, it, they usually sound more reasonable because they're appealing to emotions, right? They're talking about like, look, immigration, poor child trying to cross the border. Uh, you have to do the same thing for, for, from your side of the house, right? And this is how you do it, for example, who, like if you illustrate who is it going to harm, right? But for example, if you're trying to defend like efficiency of government, like uh, if you're trying to defend like uh, uh, privatized companies or something like that, so if you're trying to defend taxation or non-taxation or something like this, it's very cool and crucial usually to translate this stuff into something that is much more graspable to a judge and to people who are judging you. So usually the way you do it is like taxation is the money that you are not receiving in order to how do you say uh, in order to pay for services of the government. So it's literally money symbolizes your work, symbolizes your time, symbolizes your sweat and your stuff that you are like uh, sacrificing in order to get, uh, which like the conclusion that you can derive from it, for example, is that there is a moral obligation to be, how do you say, uh, as efficient as possible with this money in these sort of situations. So like literally if the comparative is, will I get this money myself and like spent in a way, or will the, how do you say, uh, will uh, will the government be inefficient about it? Like literally government is taking you away from me and being inefficient. And the problem here is that people usually imagine Bill Gates when they talk about this, but the taxation and taxes are paid by loads of people, but by everybody in this situation. So it's like, sure, Bill Gates, like he ate Bill Gates however much you want. It still doesn't mean that everybody who's paying taxes and people like who are the most poor is still not giving some of their things and still deserve, how do you say, this moral and principal obligation towards them, I don't know, to, for government to take care of them, to prioritize them, to be more efficient or to do something like this. So try to translate into something that is much more, how do you say, graspable to these people and you're gonna be, you're gonna be better off uh, under this world. Cool. Um, do you have any questions so far? This sounds logical, right? Cool. <coughs> Let's continue. Let me see how much how much time did I did I already? Yeah, we can go for for a bit more. Uh, so usually uh, usually these types Usually, rarely you will have a direct debate that's going to be, oh, this is moral or immoral, or this is this or that, or something like this. So these debates sometimes happen. But usually, these things that we're doing are the things that you're going to interact on, like, how do you say, every possible, like in the majority of the debates, in the, in the econ debates sometimes, in this sort of situation. So it's usually cool to know this, like, buzzwords and stuff uh, that, are, that are helpful. So one of the things that are also... That, that people are copying a lot, and it's basically from Shen, it's very cool. Uh, it's basically easy way to prove that government owes the responsibility towards you rather than to anybody else in the world in this sort of situation, and especially if you talk about migration. So this is like, uh, I'm gonna write it in the memory. So government owes you stuff because you are specifically limited by the laws of this government. What is it doing? So for example, if I went to Amsterdam, I can smoke weed, but in my home, I would get jailed for that. So I have to accept the fact that I'm living in a country that is limiting my freedoms and limiting my stuff, and I expect something in return for that. Secondly, I pay taxes, as I said. This is my blood, sweat, and tears. Be more dramatic when you talk about taxes. I know, I know it sounds like... It's not, it's, not a it's not a magical money, it's money coming from people. And thirdly, governments can necessarily call up on you to defend them, uh, to defend them when it comes to like invasions, when it comes to stuff like that. So governments can call you up on, how do you say, uh, you to defend it. So in this regard, you can make a couple of conclusions, which is like, in comparison to other people who are not able to, how do you say, abide by this, who are not abiding by this, you should be privileged as a member of the society and as a member of this country. <coughs> Secondly, uh, government owes you some sort of defense, specifically because you would be, how do you say, called upon to defend this, this state if, if, uh, if it can't came to that in this sort of situation. So, when it comes to this, the way to combat this, so, so now let, let's go to, to the reverse, is usually the people, what people are trying to say and trying to talk about 
uh, like this moral responsibility, moral principles uh, that that comes to it. So, so as I said in the beginning, the problematic thing when you try when people are trying to say about moral moral obligation, moral principles, is that they're not necessarily targeting uh, the principal point, but they're trying to talk about utility. So this is oh, we have moral obligation to actually help black people. So fuck this. The problem is this is contingent upon you helping these people, and this is the most important analysis that you can give. So everything that you said, you wasted your time, and the most more important part of that is this is gonna help black people, blah, blah, blah. and then, 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 then continue with it. So the more important thing is, especially because in the, in the debate exists stuff like alternatives, counterprops, and stuff like that, if you have a certain policy, that you want a proper moral responsibility towards a moral obligation is to have a part in your analysis that is going to tell me why this policy is the unique thing and the only thing that fulfills this moral obligation and why they are inadequate in doing anything else rather than this, right? So that's one of the that's why I think like uh, people are too hyped about the open finals of tests, whilst quarterfinals is much better. Uh, in my opinion, so the the way that the way that, for example, when, when you talk about quarterfinals of tests, when the debate was, uh, this house would give the the state uh, like a separate state to uh, African Americans uh, within America in this sort of situation. So the best way to lose this case is to talk about, oh, we should help these people. These people are oppressed, and uh, yeah, uh, give them a state, right? Because the other side is obviously not just going to stand there and say like, yeah, sh no, no, let's not help them at all. Fuck them. Uh, they're awful, right? They're going to tell us some alternatives or they're going to tell us why this is particularly bad, right? So your burden, if you're running the principal case, is not to tell me that they are oppressed. <coughs> By the way, this is a unique thing that they're deserving in this sort of situation. So the way, for example, that they did it in this debate was literally by talking about why uh, people being denied the state and people being denied engagement with the state, not being able to vote and like uh, not being able to, to have certain rights is uniquely tied and uniquely fulfilled, not by giving them more money, but by giving them a state that is gonna fulfill them, giving them some, like a nation that was denied from them at the beginning of this sort of situation. And this is this is crucial and this is the, this is the crucial point where you, how do you say, where you win or lose, and you lose uh, where you would win or lose this debate. But the more important thing is, this is still vulnerable to people telling you, oh, but it's gonna be shit state, it's gonna be awful towards these people, or communist revolution brings harm, harms to people, right? So the more crucial thing that comes after this is the point that I talked to you in the beginning. This is, even if this brings bad consequences, why should we still do this? Or why this is still the moral and principal point? to do in the first place. And this is where, like, this is how, like, both of these things won. And this is why the most important piece of analysis, for example, in that open finals was, like, self-defense is justified even if you're doomed to fail. This is what makes the case click, even with, with people telling them this is going to fail, this is going to be awful, right? Because without this, <coughs> if this fails, they, they haven't fulfilled their moral, moral burden and, like, they, your moral burden and your moral principle doesn't do anything if I prove to you that it's going to be awful, it's going to be worse because your your cases that's going to help you. Uh, can somebody bring me a, a more voice? I'm starting to die. What? Yeah, I'm going to end soon, but like, like I, I'm, I'm starting to die with my voice. <coughs> so I'm going to wait two minutes for, for the minute because if I continue, I will die. In, in the meantime, do you have any questions for me or anything so far? So, so just to just to recap some of the things, like, like as I said. Oh yeah. Sure. Uh, so in an other debate, uh, wherein uh, I think it was again the U uh, US UDC finals, wherein uh, Bo was running the case for giving migrants citizenship. Uh, uh, all legal or illegal immigrants. <coughs> I think the analogy he ran was also the three things that they are, in, like at least the two of them, that they are law-abiding citizens yeah. and that they pay taxes to. But the argument still didn't stand because they ended up pushing a higher burden on them, telling that uh, is citizenship limited to them just abiding to these two yeah. philosophies? Like, 
uh, what was uh, what was something that went wrong there in terms of like establishing a principal person? So I think so I haven't watched the debate. That's my problem. So 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 I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with that particular with that particular thing. Thing, but my largest issue is if you're trying to defend a principle, and that principle is specifically like as I started the the, 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 the workshop. If if the motion is developed countries denying like and not communicating with uh, I say, pharmaceutical companies in the developing countries who are not abiding by ethical standards. You have to be very specific. Why in this scenario, utility is the thing that matters or the authority is the thing that matters. If you allow people to spread your burden and to be like, no, 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 by your logic, this also applies, that's fucked up. So, so you have to, your logic, has to be necessarily and specifically tied to the specific thing. So if we talk about the, the how you say, black secessionary state, it's very unique to, so, so they cannot say like, oh, but why, what about what about other people? What about Roma people? What about, like there's loads of people who were oppressed, right? And I would definitely call them out on it and be like, look, there are different people that are oppressed and they're also fucked up by the society and the state. Why not give them this, right? and try to increase their burden. The way to do it and the way that they did it is to say what uniquely was tied to the oppression of black people and slavery that warns them getting a state and not other people getting a state in the, in the beginning and in the first place, right? So that's the thing that is, that is, that is like very important and most important. Like just being very specific that your logic doesn't... So people always think that uh, if your logic proves too much, that's great. No, no, no. In the principal debates, if your logic proves too much, that increases your burden and your fact. So you have to be much more specific in these, in these particular debates in order to avoid people and also you be more diligent. If their logic is proving too much, if their logic can apply to multiple... Uh, uh, okay, cool. Thanks. If their logic can apply to... To different situations, this is something which you can call them out on, and this is something that can increase their burden. And as I said, it can either make them force them to concede and be like, "Look, dude, this is gonna uh, how do you say? Uh, there is limits to, to the principle that I'm saying, and this is the limit, and then they're fucked because they have to backtrack, or it's gonna make them accept your challenge and they're fucked completely because their challenge and their burden just become tenfold." just becomes tenfold and much more unreasonable for judge to buy. So I'm going to start finishing because like my throat is all going to die for tomorrow again if I don't. So to recap, if you're fighting for the side who has the, the, the bad position in terms of people, uh, how do you say, uh, no, so, sorry, I have a, one more, just, just one more thing, uh, just one more thing before we go. <coughs> Especially in, if we talk about like allowing some of the stuff, uh, if you're defending utilitarianism, for example, allowing torture or the, what we had as a debate. It's not necessary for you to prove, especially as utilitarian, that allowing something necessarily leads to everybody getting torture every day, all day, 24-7, right? It's unreasonable, and that's what they will want to want to prove from their side and put the word. Oh, everybody's going to get tortured, like every terrorist that they capture. No. So you still have the reality check, even in the principle, in those principle points and like this utility points, which you're going to say, look, <coughs> even if we allow some of these things. This doesn't necessarily mean that we use them all the time. We have loads of weaponry that is allowed, but it's not used 100% of the time all the time, right? Because it's used very strategically, and it's being valued by people who are much smarter than any of the debaters that are debating in this room, who know what are the harms and consequences of making a certain decision, right? So don't be afraid to sometimes when somebody is trying to prove and trying to set this like very awesome and amazing like awful burden on you to just do a bit of a reality check and tell me how is this necessarily going to play out in reality because usually when people are trying to defend the ontology or utilitarianism go with the crudest metric they start to go into this fantasy world where it, it's either slavery or it's like killing baby hitlers or or this sort of situation that's very like far from reality so you can't be the team that is going to say like look 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 mitigate let, let's mitigate this debate and let, let's let's put this debate in very much reality or how does it work as a utilitarian it's completely fine to say 
we want to do this because it's not we, we think it's worth to do because it's not going to be as abused which means that utility is higher and fuck you in this situation that's basically what you do so at the end if you're defending something that is not as intuitive try to increase the burden on the other side to make yourself more sensible by pointing out the analogies and by pointing out where this logic that the other side is applying can be applied as well as I said, slavery, incarcerating people prematurely, uh, eliminating ethical standards for medicine anywhere in order to gain this. Also try to point out the arbitrariness of some of these stuff, and the arbitrariness of utilitarianism is very easy to prove, especially when they're trying to, to point out, oh, we're going to save a thousand people, this is obviously a cool trade-off, because if they're utilitarian, their trade-off is like just one person above you. <laughs> the, the, it has to be, or their logic doesn't work, right? So you are trying to make it make it arbitrary for them if they're trying to prove it by numbers and stuff like that. And I think those are the best ways and best things to, to, to try to how to say prove the principle. As I said, nobody ever is gonna in the principle and moral debate is gonna debate what is the technical difficulty between what Hegel said, what Kant said, and what like every contemporary philosopher or whatever or whatever said? It's usually going to be bashing with uh, how do you say uh, bashing with with these analogies. Ha ha! What about slavery? Ha ha! What about uh, this sort of situation? Just know how to play that game and know how to like uh, be confident enough, uh, confident enough about it in, in your in your own case. Uh, and 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 in the end, like when you become more confident about it, you will know to have a ready answer, even if they try to, to throw slavery at you, you know how to defend that it's not the same thing, or it's not applicable, or something like this. So, cool. I can't speak anymore because I'm gonna die. Uh, I hope that, do you have any questions before we die? Or before, before I die? <laughs> uh, no, uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, cool. Uh, uh, and thank you for listening to me. Cool. Thank you.